Hello all, this is the Owl, and today we're finally going to finish off our little analysis and review of the Corpse Party Blood Covered Manga, and I'm sure there were literally tens of you waiting to see this. Before we start, however, I just want to address something that came up last time. Ugh. Most of what I do on this channel is analysing, breaking down, and expressing my opinion about a manga. Not just in terms of themes, characters, and narrative structure, but also in terms of what I think works and what I think, well, doesn't. And the latter seems to have left a few fans of Corpse Party with a mild case of the Russell Jimmies. So, let's get one thing straight, right off the bat. I don't hate Corpse Party. I actually really enjoy maybe two thirds of it. However, that other third is pretty bad, particularly its flabby, tedious, and disjointed second act. Now, it is possible to enjoy something for what it is without giving it a tongue bath. And I think that it's important to not only be able to criticize, but to withstand criticism of something you like. And if this criticism bothers you, then maybe give some thoughts as to why. Regardless, today we're going back to the parts of the manga that I really like. Okay, okay. With that out of the way, let's get on with the recap. A gaggle of high schoolers, as well as their teacher, are drawn into the shadowy nightmare reality of Midwich Elementary, I mean Tenjin Elementary, a very, shall we say, Silent Hill school filled to the brim with bloodthirsty, vengeful ghosts of dead kids. They got sent there after they performed a ritual they found online, involving a paper effigy of someone called Sachiko-san. Our characters include the bland as milk and not really protagonist Satoshi Mochida, and his little sister Yuka, Naomi Nakashima, and her friend slash maybe love interest Seiko, Ayumi Shinozaki, an amateur occultist, Yoshiki Kishimura, a bad boy with a soft side, Yui Shishido, their dits of a teacher, and Morishige, a quiet, socially awkward boy with black hair and glasses, which, by the unspoken rules of manga, means that, of course, he is going to be a baddie. Seiko was the first to cark it, hanged mysteriously in the girls' toilets, in likely the most upsetting and memorable death in the manga, which caused substantial psychological damage to her poor friend Naomi. We come to realize that not only are the students scattered around the school, they're also trapped in different iterations, separate dimensions within the school, a plot element that I'm not the biggest fan of. As the story slowly makes its way along, we get some more mysteries and the characters continue to get bumped off one by one, including one of my favorite characters, Yui their teacher, who gets done downright dirty by the story, impaled by a variety of sharp objects, and then crushed, as well as Mayu, who got turned into Mayu Nays after being rammed into a wall at high speed. We also got a death for Ayumi and Yoshiki, but it was just a fake out. Somewhere in all this nonsense, Ayumi lost her piece of the Sachiko effigy that they used for the ritual, and it was destroyed by a ghost. However, Ayumi did find the piece belonging to Naomi. This is a minor detail that is rather easy to overlook, but as it's a huge plot beat in this act, 
remember it. Haha, <laughs> no spoilers, but remember it. They also encounter a mysterious girl, no, a different mysterious girl, called Naho, who we haven't really gotten a grip on yet, and never completely will. She's implied to be responsible for the original ritual that brought everyone here, but also helps save the characters from ghosts multiple times. Our not really main character Satoshi loses his sister Yuka, who is, in turn, found by the gallant and ridiculously handsome Yuya, another secret psychopath in the mysterious annex of the school that appears to be quite choosy about who it admits and who it doesn't. Meanwhile, actual main character Yoshiki is bashed by the Jason-esque Yoshikazu, a silent juggernaut of a man that wanders the halls of Tenjin and is believed to be the actual killer. Yoshikazu eventually returns him to Ayumi and no, I still have no idea why this happened. Yoshikazu Yanagi Hori is the son of the original principal of Tenjin, both of whom neck themselves at some point in its history, after a spate of kidnappings that left three students dead and horribly mutilated, and a fourth, the mysterious girl in red, missing. Naho, the potentially evil witch girl, explains her plan to purify Tenjin. They'll need to work together to evade the killer while completely repairing five generators, and then try to escape through the exit gates. I mean, they'll need to find the missing organs belonging to each victim, which was a lengthy scavenger hunt in the game, and a fairly brief sequence in the manga. After returning the organs, the pair seems to succeed, as the trio of kids return to normal ghosts, I don't know, and send Yoshiki and Ayumi back to their reality. However, none of their friends made it out with them, and one of the ghosts informs them that, whilst freeing them did break down the silly dimensions thing, Tenjin can only truly be purified if the killer confesses and apologizes. And, as we see in a flashback via psychic projection, the true killer turns out to be none other than Sachiko, the mysterious girl in red who is playing the Freddy Krueger to Yoshikazu's Jason. And that's where we left off last time. Who will live? Who will die? Will the mysteries of Tenjin ever be fully solved? Will Yoshiki ever have his feelings towards Ayumi requited? Will Yoshiki ever get a haircut? Does Satoshi ever become an actual protagonist? Let's find out. And I will say that, while Act 1 is still my favourite bit horror-wise, Act 3 is actually really good too, both in terms of the art and the narrative. Speaking objectively, it's likely the strongest part of the manga, although it is, by a mile, the least scary part. Mostly. Regardless, it's time to head back into the night and see just how dark this all gets before the end. Won't you join me? Volume 4 opens right where we left off, at the revelation that Sachiko was the original killer and that she's, for some reason, been using the ghost trio to keep the curse going. Ayumi and Yoshiki reason that, to break the curse, they'll need to figure out what the hell her motivation is. But they've escaped, right? Nope. Ayumi wants to go back into Tenjin to try and get everyone else out too. Heroic, sure, but Ayumi, do you have a death wish? Yoshiki quite reasonably says no thanks, and yay, 
some actual characterization, reveals his feelings for Ayumi, and also that he's more than a little jealous of Satoshi bogarting all the ladies due to his author insert powers of complete and inexplicable irresistibility. Ayumi, in turn, basically tells him that he can sod right off, and heads back through the portal. She arrives and finds that, sure enough, the school has been disrupted. All the dimensions have finally been combined into one, but it's starting to collapse. Yeah, you'd best get a wiggle on. We cut over to Morishige. You remember, that nasty little psycho who was playing around in Mayu's innards earlier, and also approached Yuka with some very negative energy, shall we say. Turns out he's always had feelings for Mayu, as she was genuinely nice to him, despite him being a bit of a creeper. Huh. And that's some more pretty interesting characterization. His habit of taking pictures of the various corpses within Tenjin is actually some kind of macabre coping mechanism, in that the Schadenfreude allows him to get through this somehow. We also get the implication, and this is kind of messed up, he's desperately searching for Mayu, and he didn't realize that the gigantic splat he was fooling around in was actually, well, her. That's, oh man. Sure enough, he gets a mysterious call that turns out to be Mayu's ghost, who basically tells him that, yep, those were her remains that he was treating like a squishy ball pit. And his reaction is, cheesy Pete, that's rough. Wow, way to make me actually feel bad for this nutter corpse party. You're kind of a bastard. I hope there aren't many more frigging tragic beats like this by the end. Ha ha ha. As I've mentioned, the middle portions of the manga were kind of meh, but the third act is legitimately excellent. It's a lot less, well, scary, but it feels like the characters are starting to get fleshed out a bit more, and some even get actual arcs before, you know, the story goes completely off its bloody nut in the final volume. Oh man, don't worry, we'll get there. Ayumi, meanwhile, is frantically searching for her friends, and hears someone screaming. She rushes off towards the noise, but is too late to stop a despairing Morishige from jumping out of an upstairs window. Yeah, I know you feel bad, Ayumi, but this little butt pipe isn't worth it. She's on the verge of having a breakdown of her own, but hears a familiar voice behind her. She turns and sees that, yay! Yoshiki decided to come along too, likely due to his unrequited feelings for her. See, corpse party, this is what you call an arc. And sure enough, we get a really heartwarming little sequence showing us that despite him being bullied and hated, which caused him to become a right hard bastard, this group of students actually made him feel human again, and yeah, as I keep saying, why wasn't this guy the main character? Aww, and it looks like Ayumi might actually have feelings for him after all, although we literally never get anything about this later, spoilers. And I think that even in the external stuff, the various sequels and follow-up games and prequels, these two never actually get together. Which is a pity, as I find this pair oddly believable as a couple too. But at least his character is a lot more likeable than it is in the game, where he varied from being sort of a douche to being a gigantic douche canoe. The pair continue to wander the halls, having a few more near run-ins with dangerous ghosts, and do eventually find Satoshi and Naomi unconscious but alive, providing us with, yeah, 
yet another bit that managed to hit me right in the feely organs. The gang is finally starting to get back together. Awesome. They chat for a bit, sort of going over everything we already know. But one thing to note here, when they go over the dead characters, one is conspicuously missing. Hmm, could it be that I've deliberately misled you? Nah, I'd never do anything like that. Anywho, they decide to go off and find Yuka next. And that brings me to one part of the manga that I've been dreading. <sighs> okay, let's get this over with. Our perspective shifts over to Yuka and Yuya, and somehow Yuka still doesn't suspect that this bloke is bad news. He quickly tips his hand though by calling her Yuka. Ah, but why does that make her worry? Well, okay, let me see if I can explain. As you might already know, Japanese uses a system of affixes to indicate personal relationships. I'm naturally not going to go over all of these because there are rather a lot and they're pretty damn complicated, as well as being tied heavily into Japanese social practices and hierarchies. You go down from the formal sama and sensei to the more neutral son used among those close together within a hierarchy or as a third party referrer, then down to Chun and Kun, which indicate a more friendly, casual, or at times familial relationship. Kun is usually quite affectionate. However, referring to someone without an affix is extremely intimate usually only used between immediate family members, incredibly close friends and the like. Outside of these relationships, this would be considered extremely rude, and about the only time you'll hear it is when a superior is cussing out a subordinate or a teacher is chewing out a student. Sort of. Japanese is complicated, but... Yuya calling her Yuka rather than Yuka-chan, while this may seem innocuous to someone outside of Japan, is cause for alarm. It's suddenly implying a level of intimacy that is not present out of nowhere. Yup, he is determined that Yuka is now his own little sister. And this is where you start running, Yuka. Yeah, just like that. She actually makes it a fair ways before he catches up to her and, oh crap, he's got a knife. Before this can go any further, someone belts Yuyo on. It's a somehow still alive Kurosaki. He attempts to talk Yuya down and gets sucker stabbed in the throat for his trouble. Jeez, why are you still here, Yuka? See, this is what I mean. And, okay. This is another part of the manga that's a bit infamous, and so I'm mostly going to skip it. Because, okay, remember that subtext I mentioned between these two? This is where it gets icky. Yuya ties Yuka to a table in the science lab, and yeah, there's nothing overt or even really on the margins, but it's still just greasy and uncomfortable. The way the characters are positioned is more than a little suggestive, and I'm not the only one who does not enjoy the sequence at all. It's made all the worse by the party simply walking by and not noticing them. What is this, an American tale? Just look left, you idiots. Fortunately, Yuka only gets a bit cut up and mildly terrorized, but yep, skip. Thankfully, the party passing by was a bit of a narrative fake-out, 
as Satoshi is able to intervene and stop all of this before it can go any further. There's a brief fight, then they try to reason with him, which likely thanks to Satoshi's, what do you call a male Mary Sue? Well, those powers does actually have an effect. Yuya begins to break down, and the dark hair, mist, begins to swirl around him, much as it did Naomi in the nurse's office and a few other characters since. Which, ugh, okay, in retrospect, I should have explained this earlier. This is actually a huge deal in the games, a phenomenon called the darkening. This begins to happen when someone is overwhelmed by their own dark emotions while within Tenjin, allowing the school to essentially absorb or puppeteer them, generally to get them to hurt themselves or their friends. There's a bit more to it than that, and we'll be dealing with it heavily moving forwards. It's not really explained until much later, and barely explained at that, but now you know what all of that is. Anywho, Yuya appears to stab Satoshi, but it turns out that Sachiko blocked it with her face? Ha, ah, the joys of being undead, I suppose. But, of course, she didn't stop him because she's turned good or anything. Oh no, she just wants them for herself, and makes a reference to her mother? Eh? Don't worry, this is at least explained later. Sachiko's backstory, yeah, remember when I mentioned that there were three infamous bits in this manga? That's the final one. Ugh, we'll get there when we get there, I guess. And at least it's way way less icky than her story in the game. I'll talk about that at the end of this video. But, sure enough, she summons Yoshikazu and he does his Jason thing, bashing Yuya over the head with his massive sledgehammer. And I kind of want to buy Yoshikazu a six pack for this alone, because Yuya sucked. Regardless, the party leaves and the last we see of Yuya is his fate, being turned into a living anatomical model. Eh, you got off easy, in my opinion, you sicko. The party decides to find their last living member, Yui Sensei. You know, the one that got final destinationed by that stupid looking ghost kid. Yeah, she did. Only, what the hell, kids? I think your teacher might be hiding superpowers because she's somehow still alive. Or is this her ghost? Nope, it's this large diameter dickhole playing a prank, and he runs away with the party in hot pursuit. They spot a massive blood trail and decide to follow it and oh no, what the hell, yeah. Either surprise superpowers, or this was some kind of miscommunication between the artist and the writer, because she is still totally alive, albeit mildly stabbed. She actually somehow managed to get through to the ghost kit, and he both saved her and brought her students to her. They decide that they need to get some help as she's coughing up blood and slipping in and out of consciousness. So they want to go to the nurse's office, but Naomi warns them about the hair ghost. So they end up in the custodian's room, which actually looks pretty safe. They do a bit of battlefield first aid on Yui Sensei, and they find a VCR and a tape, which they naturally play. We get another pretty damn fun sequence. It's a full-on, 
found footage segment. Yeah, I just love this. I am a nut for found footage, to be honest, as anyone on the Discord will attest. The footage shows us a journalist that we've been finding documents from, a chap called Kokibiki. He is a horror author, and he and his assistant infiltrated the school to do some kind of study. And at last, we get another big piece of the mystery. This bleach looking bugger is the sensei that Naho, you know, that maybe, maybe not evil girl, has been looking for. They find some more ghosts and wind up in hot water and are eventually cornered, but are able to somehow escape with some injuries. We also learn from their discussions that there is a reversal ritual that will allow people to return from Tenjin. The party resolves to go and find Kokibiki and ask him how to do this before an unearthly scream from the video gives us his death as what the bloody hell is that thing? Whatever it is, I'll be seeing it in my nightmares tonight as it rips out his throat. Uh oh. It turns out that Korkibiki's ghost is actually in the same room with them, and he tells them that, unfortunately, the ritual will not be able to send them back. And this is partially his fault. Naho, who came in search of him, amped up Sachiko's powers substantially when she was darkened and absorbed. Her magical abilities reinforced the curse. A short interlude shows us their history together. He was once a famous but struggling horror author, and she was a rising star, as well as an actual psychic. Okay, she became sort of his apprentice, and uh, quite a bit more than that by the sounds of it. Is this icky? Well, let's take a look. She's 16, and wait, how old is this guy? Like 20? 22? Let's check the wiki. I'm sure he's... Oh. Oh. Abort video, abort video, cut to commercial now. Okay, that's pretty gross. She is 16 and he's 38. What the fuck, Japan? Forget May, December. This is May and July of the next year. <sighs> Regardless, to help him get some material, Naho invented a ritual that would help them get into Tenjin. But due to his feelings for her, he decided to leave her behind. She ended up following him, but her resentment at what she saw as abandonment led to Naho darkening, and she's the thing that ripped out his throat. Also, huh, so now we have two hypermanic murder girls on this channel that like getting head pats. Anyway, Sachiko stole Naho's power via wibbly wobbly darkening stuff which is what allowed Tenjin to become this dangerous. Kibiki tells the party that he wants to drain Naho's power from Sachiko, which would essentially weaken her enough for them to maybe be able to exercise her and to escape themselves. Okay, yet another plan. This one is implied to be as simple as finding Naho and snapping her out of it somehow. We also get another hint towards, yeah, there are rather a lot of mysteries piled up at this point. In this case, why they ended up here in the first place. We're told that someone did indeed bugger up the ritual, but Kibiki explains that after they nerf Sachiko, all they need to do is find the pieces of the effigy and put them back together. But wait, didn't Sachiko burn Ayumi's piece? We'll have to see. Oh, and the person who buggered up the ritual is Ayumi. Sort of. 
turns out that the instructions on Nahua's website were wrong. See kids, don't do occult shit you find online. There's a bunch of pointless arguing, but they manage to sort it out, and they split up again into two groups, aiming to go and find Nahu. Yoshiki and the now very sad Ayumi go one way, and Yuka, Naomi, and Satoshi go the other way, reasoning that this room is safe enough to leave Yui in to recuperate. Only he suspects that there's something he hasn't realized yet. Sure enough, they find a closet containing the corpses of Naho and Kibiki, and this in turn contains a tunnel, which the trio decide to explore, and in a sequence that I rather like, they find what appears to be a hidden garden with a ladder leading up. They follow it and, huh, the ladder leads to the girl's bathroom. And no, this is all a big red herring, probably just a reference to a particularly nasty plot beat in the game, which fortunately never made it into the manga, but at least the visuals are very nicely atmospheric. Let's move on. Ayumi and Yoshiki, meanwhile, resolve that a bookish sort like Naho might be in the library, and for once they are correct. Ayumi confronts her about the ritual she posted online and why the instructions were deliberately incorrect, which resulted in tons of innocent kids getting sent here to die. Naho, who is clearly evil now, basically says too bad, so sad, she did it on purpose for, yeah, I don't know. This character is, by a mile, the most confusing part of the manga, but I guess she was deceived by Sachiko. Ayumi, being somewhat intelligent, puts together that Naho, as she's still searching for her boyfriend slash teacher slash father figure, yeah, that'll never not be gross. She doesn't remember killing him and taking the hard road here, straight up shows her a picture of their corpses, telling Naho the truth. Then this happens, yeah, I've got no bloody clue. She darkens, attacks Ayumi and prepares to tear out her throat before <laughs> Yoshiki clobbers her with a chair. That's brilliant. But unfortunately, it does sweet sod all. They are, however, eventually saved by the ghost of Kibiki, who is able to snap Naho out of it and yeah. This here is the panel where I have to finally admit, this manga's kind of working. Anyway, the two are set free, and I'm guessing that Naho retrieves the power that Sachiko took, although this is never really spelled out, and the rest of the party catches up with the duo. We also, at last, learn a bit more about Sachiko herself. After finding out her true name, Naho went to visit her, and the interesting thing here is that the true name is Sachiko Shinozaki. Wait, why does that name sound familiar? When Naho found Sachiko, she was already a ghost, or rather, I guess, an onryo, which I explained in part two. She's playing in the ruins of her house, alone. She then attacked Naho, and I'm guessing this is where Sachiko darkened her, and proceeded to haunt her and stalk her wherever she went, which I guess fills in the time gap a little. Oh, and Naho brought yet another character with her, Sayaka. No, this never comes up again, and is probably just a nod to the game. We also get a bit more background on the school itself. It was a spooky place long before Sachiko's haunting. Nasty incidents and mysterious deaths weren't uncommon, with the first major event being the school nurse falling down the stairs to her death in a terrible accident. Naho reveals that she thinks there must be some connection to the original principal of the school. Remember, 
that dude who was related to Yoshikazu, we got a very brief mention of him back in part 2. Well, he topped himself in the annex. And yeah, he was a much bigger deal in the game. Before they can discuss this further, they are interrupted by Sachiko herself, who somehow blasts apart Kibiki's ghost. Yeah, I am just rolling with it at this point, which causes Naho to go berserk and engage in a full-on magic battle with the creepy little Onryo. But she is quickly overwhelmed and also gets kaploded. Fortunately, this leaves Sachiko injured? What are you, a troll from The Hobbit? Can you even injure a ghost? Whatever. She retreats temporarily. Ayumi puts together what you might have twigged onto yourself. She and Sachiko share a last name. And, unlike the others, she was able to understand the words of Naho's spells. This is another aspect of the story that's barely touched on in this manga. But in the game, it's a much more important plot beat. Spoiler, she is actually Sachiko's cousin, and I'll explain the rest a bit later. However, Ayumi is starting to darken herself, likely as a result of her deep guilt for bringing everyone here. There's, again, a bit more to it, but we'll get into that in Volume 5. Regardless, they decide that they have another lead, the principal's death and the creepy annex. But as it so happens, Ayumi isn't the only one that's starting to come down with a case of the darkening. That brings us to the end of Volume 4. Volume 5, the final volume, is, believe it or not, where things go completely cuckoo nuts of bananas and also get really, really dark again. Still, it's also likely the objective best part of the manga. But before that, let's take a break. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And we're back. The final volume opens with Sachiko in pretty rough condition after her magical battle with Naho. She's hacking up the old cherry wine and is unable to move. Hopefully this will be enough to buy the party some time. I will also note that this is the first point in the story where we really see our primary antagonist in a somewhat vulnerable state. Keep this in mind going forward, it's actually pretty clever to show it here. Back over to the main party, they're going through the principal stuff in the annex, and Naomi is fretting because she lost her piece of paper. Um, you're going to have to tell them sooner or later, Ducky, but I guess you're kind of screwed. And this is one of those things that bothers me a bit. See, in a story, your characters should always know roughly what the reader knows. Here, we know that Naomi's paper isn't gone, Ayumi has it. So her spending so much time fretting is kind of frustrating, to be honest. Regardless, as they search, another ghost, the principal himself, walks through the room, but does not appear to notice the party. Outside, they hear a thud, and it's the principal falling from the top floor. Oh, we're doing this thing now. He's kind of reliving his last moments over and over again in a sort of punishment loop. Next to him, though, is a quite feminine purse, which I'm not one to pass judgment, but probably does not belong to him, 
as it's glowing and emitting a very unpleasant aura, despite its prosaic appearance. Satoshi approaches, and as the principal falls again and again, experiences a trademark flashback vision, seeing something that happened. Here we go. Finally, we get the big reveal. Sachiko's backstory and the inciting incident that caused her to become an Onryo. She was at school one day when she saw the principal struggling with her mother, the nurse, which I guess implies that her mother is the hair ghost. This culminated with her mother falling down the stairs to her presumed death. Oh yeah, now we're getting into the dark stuff again. Inside the purse, Satoshi finds a tongue and wonders if it's Sachiko's. But Sachiko has a tongue. Weird. And spoiler, this is actually her tongue. I don't know, is this a plot hole? Yeah. The party start to put together a theory. The principal killed her mother, causing her to be trapped here as an Onryo. You're not wrong. But this isn't the full story. They reason that if they go to the nurse's office and talk to the hair ghost, they might be able to prove this theory. Naomi is understandably not happy about returning there, but Satoshi reassures her. They'll make sure nothing bad happens to her. Ayumi and Satoshi enter the office. And yeah, the only reason I know it's Ayumi is that he says her name. I swear, these two are very difficult to tell apart at times, and sure enough, the ghost is in there, and things start to get a little hairy. Get it? Hairy? Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. They see a familiar figure behind the curtain. They hesitate, not sure whether to pull it back or not, and... <laughs> Bloody hell. Okay, that one actually got me. Yup, that's definitely Sachiko's mum. And brace yourself, because things are about to get stranger. They decide to try giving her the tongue they found. I guess assuming that it's such a cause and uh stop showing me that thing it's freaking me out for some reason after showing her the tongue the ghost hair fog thing yeah I got nothing starts calling Ayumi Chizuru huh yeah this is a reference to the familial bond but it never comes up again however Ayumi aw you're such a good person comforts the ghosty, and okay, yeah, that's a really striking panel. Yoshie, the ghost, now in a much less, yeah, that's going to haunt my nightmares tonight form, thanks them profusely for returning the tongue, and yup, it's time for some more dark stuff. They talk with Yoshie, and she agrees to send them into a flashback much as the little ghost girl did for Ayumi last time. Okay, let's do this. Turns out that, according to Yoshie, the principal was, let's say, pursuing her with ignoble intentions, and either intentionally or unintentionally pushed her down the stairs to her death. As she lay dying, she saw, okay, this is another bit that I'm going to have to trim substantially because some of these panels are a bit much. But he noticed that Sachiko was watching him, caught her, and choked her out as a dying Yoshie watched. Yep, that'll do it. The principal hides the corpse and okay, that's another really great panel as Yoshie curses him and his bloodline. Trapped within the nurse's office, the place where she always worked, Yoshie gradually went insane, unable to reach out and get her revenge. In response to this, Sachiko's ghost would wander off and do 
something. After a indeterminate amount of time, Yoshikazu, who I'm guessing was friends with Ghost Sachiko? I'm not clear on this to be honest. Regardless, he went off nut and killed those three students, probably under Sachiko's manipulation. And this resulted in Yoshie's curse being fulfilled, as both the principal and his son died by their own hands. She doesn't remember much more, but does tell the pair to read her diary. Wait, did you keep that as a ghost? I have so many questions. But the diary does fill in a few more gaps. Yoshie was lonely and missed her job helping kids, so Sachiko continued to bring children into the school for her. Essentially, Sachiko was trying to comfort her dead mother. Woof. As time passed, Sachiko killed and killed, and Yoshie fell deeper into loneliness and madness, and they both became less coherent and more malevolent as the handwriting and diction within the ghost diary start to fray. I've always loved the idea of a diary as a storytelling element within horror, and as an aside, I've actually got a mostly finished horror novel written in diary form. Anywho, Yoshie tells them that Sachiko's body is in the basement. We then get a bit of, eh, completely pointless fan service where, I kid you not, Ayumi suddenly attempts to jump Satoshi's bones out of literally nowhere. Ah, author insert characters, gotta love him. But this is thankfully stopped by Yoshiki, giving us a, okay, I'll admit, that's a really funny panel. I guess this was brought on by the darkening, but yeah, totally unnecessary. As the party heads back to check on Yui-sensei, Ayumi sees Naomi and Satoshi are actually getting pretty close, and the jealousy causes her darkening infection to flare up. Just like that, she's possessed again, and attacks Naomi with a shard of glass. But it's blocked by, oh hey, it's Kibiki's assistant's ghost, and spoiler alert, this dude is probably one of the most confusing and plot holy characters in the entire manga. We'll get to that. Taguchi is able to subdue her, but as it so happens, he seems to recognize Naomi for some reason, and not necessarily in a good way, but he won't say more. He does, finally, explain the darkening, but as we've already done that, skip. He also warns them that, even though Ayumi is subdued, once you've been darkened, it never goes away, and you will eventually and inevitably succumb. Sort of like spiritual herpes, I guess. We get a bit of moping and doping from Naomi, who, ugh, is now part of a rather forced love triangle with Ayumi and Satoshi, and she's still worried about her loss of her paper, which she still hasn't told the others about, and is going to be a big deal moving forwards, this annoys me. Now, this is a plot element that I wish the story took a bit more time to explain, but it's really interesting. Not only does the school have a host of killer ghosts, it also causes your darkest emotions, your fears, and your jealousies to gradually intensify until you go insane via the darkening. And sure enough, seeing Ayumi's feelings for Satoshi is starting to darken Yoshiki. It's a very Silent Hill concept that, I'll be honest here, would have made a far more interesting plot focus than silly looking ghosts. Regardless, you'd all better get a wiggle on before more people start going nutty buddies. Taguchi agrees to take them along to find Sachiko's remains, and we get, yeah, well done. A pretty heart-wrenching little aside, as Naomi decides that, if need be, she would willingly sacrifice herself 
and let the others escape, remaining here forever with her dead friend. That's really sad, man. Especially considering that we know Ayumi actually has her fragment, and it's Ayumi that has permanently lost hers. Back in the custodian's room, Taguchi tends to Yui-sensei, suturing her stab wounds and flirting with her a little bit. Dude, you're a ghost. Wait, you are a ghost, aren't you? Otherwise, how would... you know, it doesn't matter. And again, expresses curiosity about Naomi, asking Satoshi to tell him all about her. Remember this for later as it does come up in Oh Man, You'll See. He also lashes out at Naomi when he drops his notes and she offers to help. Yeah. Not only is he curious about her, he seems to have a weird, visceral dislike of her. Yoshigi is indeed starting to darken, but Satoshi, who is a blithering idiot, remember, this dude sent his little sister out into the school alone at one point. Can you tell that I strongly dislike this character? Well, he thinks that it's because he didn't notice that Ayumi was darkening? Dude, you don't understand what jealousy is. Ah. Taguchi leads them to the incinerator, which apparently is the only way to access the basement now. And they crawl in after him. Before too long, they indeed find themselves in the basement, with an elaborate occult setup, which Ayumi believes to be a spell to bind souls to the school. Okay. And yes, this entire basement lair area will be the setting for the final climactic confrontation of the manga. Sort of. You'll see. They continue on into the creepy basement, not sure quite what they're looking for, or where Sachiko's body could even be when... Oh crap! Hello there, Yoshikazu! Nice day we're having! Are those dead kids on your shoulders? They are, aren't they? Taguchi sends them off alone, striding forwards to hold off Yoshikazu himself while they search, and soon they find themselves in a torture chamber of sorts, which, oh man, I can only show you maybe half of it. Yeah, this is another part of the manga that's really, really gory. If you want to see all of this nastiness for yourself, feel free to check out the full manga. Remember, I'm actually skipping rather a lot here. Yoshikazu returns, and they find themselves trapped, hiding under tables, whilst he begins hacking up one of the corpses he was carrying above them. Then, in a horror beat so absolutely classic and yet perfectly horrible, one of the corpses falls down right in front of Naomi and, yep, as you probably expected, it's Seiko. The corpse spits up a bunch of blood, likely just nasty dead person gas stuff. And yeah, this bit is probably the most effective horror sequence in this entire manga. I'll say that the old starfish had a death grip on my chair during this one. Naomi is able to stay quiet, and Yoshikazu eventually leaves with her body. But Wait, who was he hacking up then? Welp, I can't show you much of this panel at all. But it's Taguchi, and he's been completely eviscerated and dismembered. Oh. But okay, I am very confused here, because he wasn't a ghost? But then, how did he survive for this long? I mean, what did he eat? What did he drink? I guess it's not very important, but it's still a bit of a plot hole. Let's move on.
The party, now back together, mourns Taguchi, who I guess gave his life to save them. And Naomi, in another bloody sad little beat, gives Satoshi her favorite charm, as she knows that, without her paper, she's not going to be able to go back with them. Man, that's really sad, and also really dumb. They reckon that they can follow Yoshikazu's trail back to Sachiko's lair. They're going to have to put foot, as both Yoshiki and Ayumi are continuing to darken at a pretty rapid rate. And, sure enough, after a bit more Blair witching through corpse-filled corridors, the party finds Sachiko still very weak in another magic circle, surrounded by corpses. A corpse party, if you will. They pause to come up with a plan of attack, but before too long, Yuka is possessed and runs over to Sachiko, giving us easily one of my favorite panels in the entire manga. Holy balls, is that terrifying. And so is that. Yep, now she has no tongue. But how is she talking? Eh, not important, especially since this final battle sequence is actually really, really well executed. Poor Yuka gets her face slashed pretty deeply by Sachiko, another fairly graphic panel that I'll spare you, and Satoshi gets belted one out of nowhere by Yoshikazu. Uh-oh. Yoshiki, however, appears to be able to resist the darkening and fends off Yoshikazu with a metal pipe. Meanwhile, Sachiko is still going to town on poor little Yuka, ripping into her with scissors until Naomi is able to shield her, getting a decent stab of her own. Ayumi steps up to bat and prepares to exorcise her, but in response, Sachiko unleashes her full power and, huh, when exactly did this manga start to kick every inch of the ass? The boys, working together, drop a stack of those old heavy desks onto Yoshikazu, taking him out of the fight temporarily, and they also succeed in pinning Sachiko while Ayumi sets up her spell, using a vial of her blood to alter the magic circle. This appears to be working, but Sachiko reverts back to a dead little girl and pleads with Satoshi who, because he's a moron, lets her up for a second, which naturally gives her an opening to jump onto him, bath some blood, why, and then attack Ayumi, injuring her hand and shattering her vial. Yeah, why wasn't Yoshiki the protagonist again? Satoshi's an idiot, and it makes him very difficult to root for. Yoshikazu, now free from the desks, grabs Naomi and Yui. Oh yeah, Yui's here too. And if you forgot that, don't worry, the manga seems to do the same most of the time, and Sachiko uses her psionic abilities to hold them immobile. She taunts them for a while, including, nope, not even touching that one. What are we doing here, manga? But regardless, she attempts to get Yuka to kill her brother, which appears to be working. Seriously, this plot beat is, again, just so gross. But it's still not as gross as Sachiko's backstory from the game, I guess. Again, we'll go over that at the end. To her credit, Yuka actually goes through with it, making me suddenly side a little bit with Sachiko. Yeah, screw Satoshi, you negligent dumbass. But he is able to talk her down. Sachiko, now pissed, attacks Yuka with a flurry of knives, badly injuring her. And this gives Satoshi the motivation, I guess, to break free from her grip and shove her mother's diary into her face, showing that her mother never wanted this and that both of them have become corrupted by the school. This does not have the intended effect, and Sachiko goes completely ballistic, flying around, screaming, ranting, 
and then hitting Yui, Naomi, and Yoshiki with a massive blast of darkening energy. Naomi tries to reason with her, but she's totally gone. Now a force of pure death and destruction. Sachiko does... no, I've got no idea, but it looks frigging wicked. However, Yoshikazu looms up in front of her and tells her to knock it off and listen. I have no idea what's going on here to be honest, but I think it's implied that while they were unable to reach Sachiko, they did manage to snap Yoshikazu out of her control. For a short while, he seems to succeed, but nope. She crushes him telekinetically and then slashes him with darkening blades, I think. And the battle continues as Sachiko powers up even further, drawing the dead souls within the school into herself. Satoshi struggles to break free, but before he can do anything, he blacks out, along with everyone else. Bollocks. As she laughs, the victorious Sachiko starts, I don't know, rotting them? Darkening them? Whatever. Then, the diary begins to glow, and her mother's spirit emerges, disrupting her psionic attack and freeing the kids. With Sachiko temporarily immobilized, Yoshie tells Ayumi to finish changing the circle. But wait, didn't her little blood vial get smashed? Well, turns out that Sachiko's stab wounds make an excellent inkwell, and using her dripping blood, she finishes her work. Good job, Ayumi. Then, Gathering the emotional energies and positive feelings of the surviving party members, or something, she is finally able to exorcise Sachiko. And yeah, I won't lie, I frigging love these panels. Aww, and it's a happy ending. So that's it. Corpse party blood covered is, hang on. What do you mean there are over a hundred pages left? Okay, let's do this, I guess. The exorcism completed. The school begins to shake and to crumble, but the ghosts they have helped intervene and use their own psionic abilities to protect the party from the falling rubble. Ayumi is torn. Remember, she still has Naomi's scrap of paper, which, yeah. Again, I don't think anyone here would have remembered unless I kept reminding you. Regardless, it's not that important. What is important is that Ayumi doesn't like the idea of letting Naomi escape while she stays here, because then naturally, Naomi would end up with Satoshi. Ayumi, seriously, are you still chasing that ball of dishwater? Just hook up with Yoshiki. Dude's a legit badass. He hits ghosts with chairs. Oh yeah, looks like the darkening is still happening, despite Sachiko being released. I guess the school itself still has a nasty amount of power left. We get a fairly long sequence as they run through the collapsing school, rubble raining down around them, and they notice that the rain has stopped. Now outside, they prepare to do the reversal ritual and tell everyone to whip out their pieces of the effigy. Uh-oh. Naomi tells them that she'll be staying behind. But that she'll be okay. Her and Seiko will be together forever. This pleases the rapidly darkening Ayumi, but she manages to resist and returns the charm, apologizing. This is followed by another really, really sad sequence, as Ayumi says farewell to all her friends and tells Naomi to take care of Satoshi for her. Damn, man. And if that isn't sad enough, Yui-sensei interrupts and insists that Ayumi takes her charm, 
she will stay behind. The students naturally refuse, but she reveals that, yeah. Unfortunately, despite their attempts to give her first aid, she's bleeding out and will soon die. Holy crap! You'd best hurry and make a decision though. This dimension is starting to collapse, with gigantic black holes beginning to bloom everywhere. Realizing that there is no other choice, they all say a tearful goodbye to their teacher. And okay, yeah, I'll admit it, this bit gets me. Yui tells her students how proud she is of them, how much they've matured, and how amazed and impressed she is that they've pushed on and survived. She considers her job done and can rest easy. Bloody hell, I'm not crying, you're crying. And with that, they all put their pieces of paper together, and as energy flares around them, Yui Sensei closes her eyes for the last time, and the scene fades to black. Now, this could very well be the end of the story. A perfectly satisfactory, somewhat happy, somewhat sad, but by and large positive ending. And I am going to give you the option right now of it being just like that. To paraphrase the once great Stephen King, or was it Peter Straub, whether a story has a happy ending or not depends entirely on where you stop reading. If you do decide to stick around though, be warned, the darkest, saddest revelation in the manga is yet to come. The party awakens back in Kisaragi, a bit worse for the wear, but alive. I will say that while I haven't shown you much of it, the care that went into these final panels of the story is evident on almost every page. A ton of genuinely beautiful double spreads, yeah. As I mentioned, there is a lot about this story that I really do like. We get a very pleasant little epilogue, or at least one that starts that way. While they naturally couldn't tell anyone about what happened, all the students are recovering from their injuries, and most of them are back at school. Yuka is still hospitalized, and more importantly, Naomi has not returned. She's locked herself in her room at home. But wait, Several students and a well-liked teacher didn't make it back alive. How did they explain that? Well, as it turns out, dying in Tenjin causes everyone else in the world to forget about you. And this is what has destroyed Naomi. Her best friend is dead, and nobody but her and her handful of friends remembers Seiko at all. Even the photographs she had of her are starting to become corrupted. Then, she remembers that she has all of Taguchi's recordings and begins to watch them. The surroundings start to become familiar, and she realizes what she's seeing. It's the death of her friend Seiko. She was hanged by Yoshikazu and Sachiko and... Wait, what? There's a third person present. Oh. Oh shit. Yup. The person who hanged her was none other than Naomi herself. She killed her best friend. And this is why Taguchi was acting so weird to her. He saw all of this unfold and damn it manga, that is the most mean-spirited little twist ever. Now, I think the implication was that Naomi was watching the footage at school in the AV room or something, as we see her rushing through the corridors, but Satoshi and the rest of the survivors notice her and give chase. F 
finding her on the roof of the school about to Doki Doki Literature Club herself. They try to talk her down, but it doesn't work, and she pulls a full-on Vueko before Satoshi is able to Wazukian himself down and grab her. Literally impossible, but whatever. This is all so sad. As they hang there, with her struggling to break free and plunge to her death, her phone begins to ring, and she sees that it's a message from Seiko. It's just a single emoji, a heart, and then another heart, and another. Seiko begins to spam her with heart emojis before her ghost appears before her eyes and tells her to please go on living. Wow. Again, when did this manga start to actually work this well? Seiko's ghost succeeds, and the friends all reconcile, resolving to go on living for each other. We get a third epilogue, a threpilogue, maybe, showing us several students at another school, staying after hours, telling ghost stories as the rain beats down outside. Oh, oh shit, they're doing the Sachiko Sun ritual. Sure enough, as it continues, they invoke her by name. Somewhere, far away, we see that something answers from within a dark school, and as the clouds begin to gather, it starts to rain. Whew, damn. And there we have it, folks. Corpse Party, Blood Covered. Actually, at the end of the day, it's a pretty good manga. It starts strong, goes off into the willywags for a while, but manages to somehow finish even stronger. There are still a few things that are worth talking about, and I'm not just talking about the plot holes like how on earth was Taguchi still alive? I'm talking about a few things that were significantly different in the game, and in some ways made the story a bit more coherent and impactful, aside from one plot beat that I am absolutely grateful never made it into the manga. In brief, Sachiko's backstory was completely different in the game. Serious content warning here, because it's really screwed up. Sachiko in the game was a quiet, isolated girl who mostly kept to herself and loved the rain, which is why, I guess, the reality she created was always rainy. Then, she was, shall we say, taken advantage of by her teacher, Ugh. who then proceeded to psychologically torment her until she topped herself. The principal, not willing to let the name of the school be tarnished, helped said teacher conceal the body, which caused her to rise as an onryo. One more thing from the games that was much more spelled out. The Shinozaki bloodline, meaning both Ayumi and Sachiko, was substantially more fleshed out. Again, Ayumi is actually her cousin, and the entire Shinozaki clan has always had powerful psychic or magical abilities. There's quite a lot more, particularly in the other games and the, well, the absolutely bonkers other manga, that if there's any interest, I may take a look at one day. But for now, let's close the curtains on Corpse Party. Next up.
But regardless, thanks for watching, and good job on making it this far. If you enjoyed this video, why not stick around? There's plenty more like this, and tons more coming down the pipe. If you'd like to help us out, and make sure that Mrs. Owl and I are able to send our eventual children to a better school than Tenjin, you could always come give us a look on Patreon. If you want to come, shoot the shit, give feedback, or what have you, you could always head over to our Discord. Otherwise, cheers my friends, and take care. This is The Owl, signing off.